Okay, so we're going to be talking about the meta in Monster Hunter. For some ridiculous reason, it's a bit of a dirty word in certain circles, and talking about it is seen as the equivalent of bringing a hand grenade to a baby shower. You just don't do it, and the more damage you do, the more annoyed people get somehow. And yet, like that one spider in my room or the IRS, it's always there, always relevant, and never really goes away. For the entire history of the franchise, there's always going to be a more effective way to play the game. A faster way to do damage, to get through quests and farm materials with more efficiency, and ignoring this would be pretty detrimental if you want to properly understand the game. Of course, everyone has their way of playing. The fact that learning, improving your skills as a hunter, and picking more offensive sets is more effective doesn't mean it's a playstyle you have to subscribe to. No. What you should subscribe to instead is this channel, and if you get a kick out of playing with more forgiving skills like Evade Window or Guard, you do you, King slash Queen. However, you have to concede that you won't be getting through monsters as fast, and in a grind-heavy game like Monster Hunter, rebattling the same monster is going to be something you'll eventually have to do. Thus, it makes sense as to why players will gravitate towards power, for the sake of time and a way to show off their developing skills as a hunter. So with that, the subject of today's video. Meta has always existed, be it a standard set of skills that you'll see on every damage set, or even with a weapon-specific setup that just chews through quests faster than my ex-wife through my bank account. With that, I'd like to take a look at how the best playstyles have adapted and changed throughout the series. We'll be covering Monster Hunter 1, Freedom Unite, 3 Ultimate, Portable 3rd, 4 Ultimate, Gen Ultimate, World and Iceborne, and finally Rise. If you all like this video, and get us to an arbitrary amount of views slash likes that I decided in my head, then I'll do a special episode focused on Frontier. With that, I'm Sarah Symmetry, and this is the history of Monster Hunter Meta. Starting back in the age before fire, where we had never even heard of the phrase Insect Glaive, is the original entry on the PS2, and it's a real fossil. The old skill system is believed to have a point system behind it, however for the average player it was a guessing game. You sort of had to arrange five specific pieces like a puzzle to get any sort of effect. There really was no nuance, and without going into the game code itself, it's impossible to tell if there were points aside per piece, or if it was just predetermined combinations of specific armour pieces. I mean, Christ, I started with this game, and I've played it countless times. I still really couldn't tell you exactly how it works. Nevertheless, a sort of meta was present. One of the most prevalent strategies that does still exist to a degree in modern games was headlocking. A quick and dirty explanation is essentially doing enough damage so you could repeat the animation of a head stun over and over until the monster in question folded like paper. It was a lot easier to do in Monster Hunter 1 since there was no cooldown period for the animation whilst you built up damage to hit the next stun. It was truly comical. For this, specifically the Fatalis Lance was used, the precise pokes being instrumental to keeping this lock. Very, very simple stuff. Now moving on to Poke Village. With the traditional skill system we know and love now present in this iteration, by which I mean skills activating at certain point amounts, Freedom Unite starts to look a lot more familiar for us here. It's interesting to note that there was really no cheese, so to speak of, in Freedom Unite, perhaps one of the reasons why it's still considered to be one of the more difficult entries. No. The main name of the game here was your own skills and understanding the monster. Skill-wise, we're looking at Sharpness plus one. A lot of G-Rank equipment would receive the fabled purple sharpness when this skill was equipped, and whilst this seems fairly limited to a lot of newer players, purple hits different in this game. You see, going into the numbers a bit, there's this thing called a sharpness modifier, and it's what causes the damage to rise with each level of sharpness. Nowadays, we're used to a modifier of 1.32 for white, and 1.39 for purple, in games from Generation Ultimates onwards. But back in Poké Village, this was originally 1.30 for white, and 1.50 for purple. This was a chasm of difference in terms of damage, and coupled with the fact that the skill Stellar Hunter was introduced, it combined this increase plus one with a large attack boost. You can sort of see very clearly why people gravitated towards this. Alongside this were pieces from Shogun Cyanator and its subspecies, as well as Teostra for high levels in Razor Sharp and Critical Eye for extending the time spent in purple and the odd chance of a crit respectively. In the hands of an expert, speedruns would milk as much damage out of this combo as humanly possible, and they would look beautifully methodical to boot. 
Special shout out to the Blangonga Longsword, the copper one specifically, it loved this set. The crit eye would balance out the negative affinity and the absolutely titanic roar would be boosted by a mile of purple sharpness. Real cool stuff. However, we take a quick trip to the other side of the coin in the misty village of Yukumo. Monster Hunter Portable 3rd may have caught wind of this script that I'm talking about several years into the future, because Handicraft was absolutely gutted. Not only did Purple Sharpness not exist in this game, and players would have to settle for natural white, but if you even thought about getting close to Sharpness plus one, you'd have to infest a huge 15 points to have the privilege of changing your pigment. This was 5 points up from previous iterations, which equates to at least a whole armor piece with deco slots. As a consequence, typical melee sets would run Razor Sharp, Attack Boost or Crit Eye, and one brand new toy. The skill, Weakness Exploit. We're going to be hearing from this guy a lot more later, but for now, it was relatively tame in comparison. Weakness Exploit, or WEX as we'll be referring to it from now on, granted 50% affinity when striking a hit zone of 45 and above. This was the largest boost to crit that a hunter could get, and all while investing a paltry 10 points into a skill. It's no secret that this became a massively central part of any competent player's kit, and all players needed was a combination that catered to this. Enter Silver Rathlos. This Argent Bastard set came with Wex, Razor Sharp and Attack Up Small, with a huge amount of slots. With some creative gemming and some impressive charms, one could expect the small attack boost to fly up to large, and even another skill such as Crit Eye or even Evasion to make an appearance. Now this complemented weapons from monsters such as Green Nug Kuga or Alatreon very well, with the natural white sharpness mitigating the need for this sharpness plus one. However, this still paled into comparison with the real monster of Portable 3rd, Dragon Ammo. Dragon shots in Portable 3rd had incredibly high base damage, and acted like a piercing ammo, passing through multiple hit zones. This was further scaled up by the innate roar of the handheld trebuchet you called a bowgun, and with some very specific setups, you could see large monsters like Urgan and Ignactor completely shatter in under a minute. Shocking. Bowguns being overpowered in a Monster Hunter game, I know. Dragoness was absolutely absurd. Tri Ultimate was next, and with it, the big name was the flagship, Brachidius. Since Weakness Exploit had been nerfed to instead adjust weak zones rather than apply flat affinity, the focus shifted to the new player on the field, Challenger Plus Two. It granted a decent attack and affinity boost during the monster's enraged state, and it coupled very nicely with the absurd uptime of enraged status that a lot of G-ranked monsters had. Razor Sharp was of course a mainstay, and you'd also see pierce gunning setups in multiplayer start to shine with things like Siege Fire. But I'm stalling. You see, Bracky also arrived with something else. Slime. Yep. Honest to god, Nickelodeon tier, somebody grabbed this man a tissue type slime. Slime was the predecessor to the blast status, and it was treated like its own brand new element. Build up enough of the goop on a monster, it explodes and does flat damage, plus high amounts of part break. What made this insane is that this was innate on the powerful Bracky weapons, which boasted high raw and decent sharpness, and there were at least two other prominent melee weapons that had this option of high slime values being awakened. These were the Black Diablos Lance and of course the infamous Gron Gigas Hammer. Now on top of this, the murder machine known as the Kelby Deer shot reared its head. This bow with four players running awakened slime spammed level one shots on a monster. It would deal abhorrent levels of slime essentially trivializing all but the most powerful challenge quests, and forsook all actual damage on the shot scenarios themselves in favor of just slathering goop over the enemy. And it really, really worked. No secret then that pieces featuring high levels of Awakened and Handicraft, such as Goldbeard Cedeus and the rare Artian set, became desirable for this very reason, as well as Bombardier to increase the slime amount being gemmed in. Of course, we'd see a sizable nerf to this further down the line, with Slime's reclassification into Blast, but it was still the king at the time. Up next comes the incredibly popular 4 Ultimate. Alongside the new members of the weapon roster, Charge Blade and Insect Glaive being incredibly powerful, and let's be honest, downright busted in some cases, there was a very apparent melee meta. With Weakness Exploit still demoted to its 3U mechanics, focus was still very much on Raw. The skill Stellar Hunter from Freedom Unite returned, under the new name of Honed Blade. This granted attack up extra large and sharpness plus one. Now purple sharpness itself took a bit of a hit, going from a 1.50 multiplier to 1.44, but it was still a force to be reckoned with, 
and widely sought after by a lot of Blade Masters. Challenger retained the top spot also for the same reasons as 3U, and as such you could expect to see pieces like Furious Rajang, Rusty Kushala, and of course White Fatalis to make an appearance on a lot of sets. An honourable mention I'd like to give is to the event quest Hear No Evil, See No Evil, where the player was tasked with taking down a Ketcha Watcher, an Emerald Kongalala, and a Furious Rajang. The reward for this was the amazing GX Hunter gear, wherein all five pieces boasted three slots, and the arms and waist had six points in Challenger and Focus respectively. Just pretty damn amazing stuff. Finally, a common strategy you'd see on the hardest endgame guild quests was Hame, a Japanese phrase that I will not be translating. In multiplayer, you'd take the Gods Archipelago like Bogun, and the other three grunts would use the Gravios Giga Cannon. In summary, the LBG user would use a combination of Chained Traps, KOs, Paralysis and Sleep, all while the fucking Perforation Squad used Pierce Ammo to turn whatever you fancied into a fine mist on the ground. It was pretty common to see in 4U quest halls and turn the combination materials for Pierce into a precious commodity. Bird Wyvern Fangs were worth their weight in gold. And then Generations happened. The steps that Meta took in Generations and the G expansion were huge and have affected all games following. The reason for this were threefold. One was the restoration of Weakness Exploit back to its portable third mechanics, granting 50% affinity on a weak spot, and the second was the introduction of Critical Boost. Typically, when hitting a critical hit, players were granted a multiplier of 1.25 times damage. Crit boost, however, allowed you to increase that to a massive 1.40 times damage, all for 10 measly points. This combination was obscene, especially when combined with weapons such as Silverwind or Hellblade. Speaking of, the third shift to the meta was a rebalancing of the sharpness system. You see, in Generations Ultimate, when hunters had the ability to access purple sharpness, it was found that the previous multiplier of 1.44 had now been flattened to 1.39. Conversely, the modifier for white sharpness was increased, from 1.3 to 1.32. Sounds like a small change in a vacuum, but this drastic shortening of the void between white and purple meant that there were a lot more competitive options weapon-wise, and once again, Handicraft kind of fell off. Mind you, it was still used when it came to certain G-Rank setups, but the payoff had to really be worth it especially now it was broken up into two separate levels. Now, you'd be looking at Weakness Exploit, Razor Sharp, Critical Boost, and high levels of Critical Eye, courtesy of the Hayabusa Feather for most sets. Now, in its ivory tower ascended above this meta, however, was Valor Heavy Bowgun. Much like the Hame setups of 4U, players would siege fire pierce ammo in a fervent attempt to turn the local wildlife into an ocarina. Even by itself, this setup was incredibly potent, and was a very common problem solver if there was just some annoying shit you didn't want to deal with. Just firing volley after volley after volley of fast pierce ammo was crazy. The guns in question were either the Zenoga Heavy Bow Gun or, my personal favourite, Deora's Delphin Day. I think the main takeaway from this is the combination of crit boost and weakness exploit. They're both incredibly powerful skills even in isolation and they cost very little to activate. I'm sure tens of thousands of paragraphs have been written before about these skills and the concept of balance, so I wanted to inject my viewpoint into this discussion. Not only are these skills far too cost effective, in my opinion, with Wex being probably the single best boost for 10 points you can get on most sets, but they fundamentally do not change anything about the way a typical competent player would play. Any halfway decent hunter knows you want to hit the zone that has the best hit zone if you can. This is a fundamental mechanic you should be understanding, and it's as basic as make sure you turn on the console before you play, or trying to use a controller instead of a cauliflower. And when you add these two skills into the mix, you're getting a large damage boost essentially for free. I really do think the devs overestimate what is asked of the player with this skill. Now, rather than take a look at the cost or effect of these skills, monsters instead have been designed around what is essentially a flat damage boost for a player that knows their salt. However, this isn't what I want to see, and I really do think we're losing out on more intelligent attack skills being introduced, like Rush or Thunderclad from Frontier. Whilst it really doesn't change what you were doing back in, say, 4 Ultimate or whatever, it's not innovating anything either, and I honestly think Wex and Crit Boost need to be cuffed and restrained if we're going to see anything interesting or different make its way out of the woodwork. That, I think, is going to be a video for another time, however. Let's move on to 5th Gen. World and Iceborne introduced a brand new skill system, reducing the investment you'd have to dedicate to skills and instead providing a more skill-rich, customizable meta. 
or it would have been, until Crit Eye, Wex, and Crit Boost gained a fourth member to their lineup. Enter Master's Touch. If you crit, you wouldn't lose sharpness. I mean, surely nothing terrible will happen in a meta where you can very easily get 80 to 90% boosted crits with only three max skills and add a complete removal of resource management for free if you take three certain armor pieces. Oh, that's not bad enough? Let's add it onto the best set in the game that gives a majority of these skills just by wearing it. Thanks, Behemoth. Again, as I said before, the playstyle literally does not change. It was just doubling down on more of the same. The Draken armor was all you needed to be expected to use for the most part when running Endgame World, and with the introduction of a 10% buff in non-elemental boost, the meta stood firm. Only extreme Blade Master examples such as certain Call of Taroth elemental weapons could really break the mold. Fast forward to Iceborne, and we really didn't see too many changes. It was all still crit, all still Master's Touch, and with Shara Ishvalda bringing in amazing non-elemental options, still all very vanilla. That was until the Red Dragon landed. Safi Jeeva's set came with a myriad of elemental boosting properties, as well as providing a brand new utility for the skill Resentment. It became the new hotness. Master Rank Corv weapons were soon to follow, and this slammed elemental matchups to the forefront. Yes, whilst crit was still worthwhile to invest in, we saw a new risky playstyle, promoting even further aggression with the health drain and recovery system you had from the Dragon Awakening. Plus, the added blight resistance native on the gear actually allowed coalescence to proc easier, further increasing the elemental buffs. It was really nice to see, and I enjoyed playing with it, with a lot of different weapons being used per matchup. Everything was great. Then Fatalis came along. Appropriately for the final update of Monster Hunter's biggest game, Fatalis featured the best gear, both in armor and weapons. Not only did it lend itself well to raising affinity, but the set bonus granted unlocked skill caps for a lot of offensive skills such as Agitator and Maximum Might. Not to mention Razor Sharp. Couple that with the new highest raw weapons the Black Dragon offered, and everything got pigeonholed very quickly again. Full Fatalis, maybe a Kulv or a Vulcana piece here and there, dominated. And still, Crit Boost held strong. And now, Rise. It's still Crit, but Weapon's got a few tweaks here and there to include more exclusive skills, the wonderful Rapid Morph and Bludgeoner being fairly viable, and so on. But of course, there was always going to be one best option, and that's just a single set. Again, it's Valstrax. Dragonheart is an absurdly powerful skill, and the only requirement is to not heal past 80%. That is it. Even weapons that have a ton of skills required are running it now, like SAED Charge Blade, and they're posting competitive times to boot. Unfortunately, that means that typically the best weapons that go with this set are the Nagakuga weapons with white sharpness and good natural affinity, which leads to a disappointing lack of variety, but Perhaps we'll see something different come Sunbreak. Weapon-wise, even with the new trailers, I'm hoping there isn't an entire gulf between two melee weapons and the rest of the roster, but part of me thinks that that's unlikely to happen. I mean, here's hoping, right? I'd love to see more intelligent offensive skills that grant buffs based on more demanding player inputs, but as I said, I'd like to cover that in its own separate video, and I hope you'd like the idea of that too. But for now, that is a rundown of the meta throughout the ages in Monster Hunter. I hope you all enjoyed, and if you did, go check out some of the playlists on this channel. Trust me, there'll be stuff you like in there. Until next time, lads, take it easy.